Okay, we'll let some of the people join us here. Let's move this right there. Well, I see uh, people kind of slowly starting to filter in here. So maybe we'll just do some of the housekeeping stuff to start us off. And I'm sure we'll have a few more people joining us as we get going here. Um, all right. Well, welcome to the August edition of Land Management Quarterly. It will be the third quarterly outreach for 2024 that we've conducted. My name is Jim Jansen. And Anastasia, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Anastasia Meyer. All right. Um, we work together. Anastasia has overtaken some of the things Alan Vanalik has done, and we've conducted, um, kicking off kind of our inaugural series of outreach from this past spring and continuing in on to this summer. We have about a one hour presentation prepared to look at current state of land, or a little bit on land values, Cash rental rates. Anastasia will be getting into lease arrangements, and uh, then we'll be doing ask the expert. Just a reminder: if there's anyone joining us that works in industry, we're looking for more sponsors. A sponsorship for Land Management Quarterly. You get to provide us with a slide, feature your company, and uh, we'll be sure to point them out at least twice throughout the presentation. And uh, the sponsorship helps conduct and continue on our outreach as well as presentations we do across the state of Nebraska and the uh, Farm Real Estate Survey work. So as I mentioned before, our outline on what we intend to cover today, we'll briefly be taking a look under the first uh, sub-bullet point on land values and cash rental rates across Nebraska. We'll be taking a look at a little bit of a look on what we call the uh, cover crops and farmland leases and side of the farm real estate report. We had our special feature for 2024. Anastasia will be focusing a little bit more on communication and different things relating to terminating verbal leases. We have some dates fast approaching, so we'll be sure to take a look at that. And then we had a couple of questions submitted and we'll be taking a look at those. And hopefully those folks joining us can gain some insight. As a reminder, today's presentation will be archived and it'll be, I believe, it kind of like a YouTube video. So if you'd like to go back and watch it at another time or pass it on to someone or something else, just be aware that you'll get a reminder email in the next day or two when it gets posted. So a little bit on the Nebraska Farm Real Estate Survey. Many of you have seen this slide before. We do two things each year. We do what is called the preliminary estimates are published in the middle of March, and then the final report in June. Related to the real estate information, you can do one of two things. One, if you're joining us today, I'm assuming you may have a computer or access to one and can access the internet. Uh, the website is listed on the bottom of the slide right here. And if you notice, it's the cap.unl.edu slash real estate website. And related to the cap website, you can also uh, find historical information, historic reports we've had on there. Or you can stop by your local extension office, and uh, many of those are located throughout Nebraska, and many of the office managers across the state have copies, current copies or uh, current pages printed out from the real estate report if you would like to take a look there as well. So either check out online or stop by your local extension office, give them a call, and they can hopefully get a copy for you or get a copy out to you. Just a reminder on how we have subdivided the state or divide the state. We divide the state into eight different regions. These eight different regions are called agricultural statistic districts. And inside these regions, we have eight different regions. So you have Northwest, North, Northeast, Central, East, South, Southwest, and Southeast. And from these regions, we summarize information. 
Uh, the cash rental rates are by region, and we also summarize land values by region. A little bit on the land value side. So related to the land values across Nebraska, we come up with, with an overall average called the Nebraska Ag Land Value. It's an average value in blue of all the different types of land that we have had in the state. You'll notice in the upper right-hand corner on your monitor, we've seen some very steady growth. In the last three years, we've gone roughly 35% year over year, or excuse me, over the last three years. But the rate of growth, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it increased 16% the one year, 14% the following year, and then if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was 5%. And we've seen rapid increases in the market value of land. And I, I would surmise or anticipate that one of the leading forces is profitability of farm. In recent years, we've seen some record prices for corn, soybeans, livestock prices, cattle prices, especially in our state. And some of these things have been capitalized, meaning people have used the proceeds of those sales to reinvest into land. So where is land headed in the future? Well, if you kind of look to the past as an indicator on where things have gone, you might see a little bit of a gradual change into the future. And it wouldn't be surprising to see after rapid period of growth to see a little bit of a moderation in values. But we'll have to keep an eye on where profitability, just not for corn and soybeans, but also for cattle and things like that. And also, where is long, where are long-term expenses related to loans? So the cost of borrowing, interest rates, uh, lines of credit, land loans, intermediate loans for buying of equipment, things of that nature. So if the crystal ball got chucking up today and we would wanna see where things might settle out in 2025, I think we'll see a little bit of a moderation. It may not be uniform across the state. We may see some areas up slightly, some down slightly, but I don't anticipate we're going to see these huge increases like we've seen in the last two or three years. So just be aware of some of these changes that we have across the state. Um, on to the cash rents. I think this is maybe more of interest now that some of the negotiations or at least the initial consultation between the Landlord and tenants, the initial meetings are maybe starting to occur and making sure there's an interest with the other party to continue that contract on for next year. The University of Nebraska survey report that was issued in late June had a summary or a breakout on cash rental rates across Nebraska. And we can see these right here. This goes from Northwest all the way from to Southeast and up to the Northeast and down to the Southwest. And the first thing I'll point out on cash rents is we've seen a little bit of a mixed response, down 1%, down 4%, up 5%, up 2%. Um, to me, that says a mixed market in cash rents is probably an indication of some degree of moderation in cash rents. We're not seeing a clear trend of this things increasing across the entire state. We're seeing things moderate. And I think that would probably be tied, especially on the cropland side, to some of the different cropland prices we've been seeing I think that's probably an indication of that or maybe some of the trends associated. In addition to the average from the prior slide, we have what is called uh, HAL. HAL stands for the average of the high grade, average of the low grade, and the overall average. And we can see here, we have a pretty good breakdown across the state of Nebraska from what we call the low grade or the low third average to the high third grade or the high average. And usually in our in-person presentations, the questions start coming, what influences cash rental rates? Well, some of the things related to um, quality of the land, location, soil type, rainfall is always a big one. If you move from the southeast corner of Nebraska to northwest Nebraska, rainfall might be in the low 30s in the southeast all the way to the low to mid-teens in the northwest part of the state. So definitely the consistency of rainfall, how much, when does it come, uh, all these different things influence those cash rental rates. And that's why we see some pretty good ranges across the state when it comes to the regional cash estimates. Okay. Our next slide here, we have broken down by um, center pivot irrigated rental rates. And I'll just provide a reminder that the university also publishes survey findings on the gravity or flood irrigated rates as well. 
So be sure to take a look at those if those would be of interest to you. On average, they tend to rent about $30 to $50 an acre lower than um, the center pivot rate is. So we can see that breakout that we have right here. And uh, once again, we're seeing a little bit of a mixed response. Some areas were up slightly, some areas were down slightly, and some areas were overall, I would say 1% is fairly steady. And the irrigated rental rates assume that the landlord owns the entire irrigation system. That includes the pivot, the pump, and the power unit. If the tenant provides one of those components to the system, we would discount the cash rent to account for that. When I see discount, we're trying to adjust the cash rent to a level that makes sense given the contributions that the landlord and the tenant are both providing as part of the cash lease. So just be aware that some of the ranges that we're seeing here are influenced by maybe even the quality of the equipment in addition to the soil type location. Yes, you still need rain even if you have irrigated cropland. And um, that might explain some of the differences we see in cash rent from southeast, northwest Nebraska and back. Okay. And now on to the next thing we're going to look at is the cow-calf pair monthly rental rates. This tends to be a pretty popular rate we get asked here at the University of Nebraska. You can rent by the acre, the pair, the month, the day, the week, the animal unit, season. Uh, I tend to see people either rent by the pair. So this is one cow, one calf for one month during the summer grazing season. Uh, let's pick on Northeast Nebraska here just for a second. If you're looking at Northeast Nebraska, and let's just say this was $70 even, 70 times five is what? Is 350 for the season. So if you want to rent by the season instead of the month, you can multiply it. If you'd rent, like to rent by the day or the week instead of the uh, season, you could divide 30 against the averages we have here and come up with a daily cash rent. Uh, you know, it'd be a little bit over $2 a pair per day in the Northeast, for example. So that's how we come out with this breakout here. And uh, I had a call earlier today on stocking rates. How many pairs can you put on a property? Sometimes that question comes up, and that's a great question to pose to your local beef educator for your area of the state. Uh, I know Ben Beckman's one of them in the northeast part of the state that's have helped folks out on kind of figuring out, okay, it takes so many acres for one cow-calf pair and things of that nature. So that's the breakdown that we see right there. In addition to that, we have uh, special feature information. So this came out uh, partially from the census of ag, but we also took a look at uh, some of the cover crop practices related to farmland leases. Now, this is just a summary table, and this is the kind of summary table that you might want to go back and look at when the slides get published from our talk today. But what's the big take home? Well, I'd say look at the bottom uh, row here. There's about 21 million acres of cropland, according to the 2022 census of ag of which in 22, less, slightly less than about a million acres had cover crops planted on them, okay? So if you divide those two out, well, less than 5% of our total cropland acres have cover crops growing on them. And there's about 36,000 crop producers in our state of which about 4,500 uh, raise cover crops. So that means about 12% of our crop producers in the state cover crops. So this kind of gives you a little bit of a flavor and you can see, uh, you know, cover crops change from Northwest Nebraska, 53,000 acres, all the way up to 209,000. And I would imagine the soil type, rainfall, things of that nature might influence some of those things. Uh, just wrapping up with my slides here and then me and Anastasia will get started on the critical lease provisions and communication things we need to be looking at. Uh, one of the questions was, why are people planting cover crops? And this is kind of the breakdown that we see right here. And uh, soil health and conservation accounted for about half of the motivation. Livestock grazing and forage use, secondary, we call it secondary forage use, that was about a third. And around about 10, 12% was cost share funding, people sharing in the cost of growing a cover crop um, with uh, maybe a grant 
through like the NRCS or a local NRD, things of that nature. And if you plant a cover crop, you're talking probably at least $20 an acre in seed costs. Now, rye and some of these other seeds are a little bit less expensive than say like a mix of turnips and radishes. That can be a little bit more expensive. Um, if you have a tenant that's willing to plant a cover crop on rented land, and that benefit of the cover crop may extend beyond the length of the growing season, uh, helps with soil fertility, development of organic matter, whatever. Should a landlord uh, take off anything off the cash rent if that's the case? Well, as part of our survey work, we found out about two thirds of the folks, they didn't really take much off. Uh, about a third took off somewhere between one to 20. Once again, 10 to 20, you're getting at about half the expense if you look at just not the seed, but also even if you no-till in or plant in these cover crops. Um, it'd probably have to be at least 10 to $20 an acre, whether that's the landlord paying for a portion of that expense, or maybe they're saying, you know what, if you plant cover crops on my property, um, how much would you like off the cash rent? Well, maybe discount the cash rent 10 or $20 an acre to account for some of these things. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself and turn my video off and Anastasia will be turning hers on just momentarily here. And Anastasia, if you just wanna say next, I will uh, advance accordingly. So I'll go ahead and kill myself and just let me know when you wanna go to the next slide. Okay, thank you. You can go to the next slide. So a lot of the issues that both Jim and I face when people call us is really can be boiled down to poor communication. So between any landlord and tenant, we really are encouraging each other to open up and improve those communication lines. How do you do that? Well, right now is a great time to be going out, checking out your crop or grazing land. Um, tenants and Consider inviting out your landlord to the field. Um, show them how the, you know, if you guys are getting rain, if, how the crops are looking. Is there any weed pressures, insect pressures? Even if it is a cash rent situation, it's always good just to invite them out. Um, that way they feel like you are invested in their land. You guys can create that relationship. And as the relationships are built, communication becomes easier. So what do you guys talk about when you guys come out into the um, field or discuss at coffee, however you guys want to go about that communication? Well, first off, build that relationship and then you can start addressing those bigger challenges. So um, if there are any issues in the field, that's something to be brought up. If there is constantly a ditch in a field, um, I'm in southeast Nebraska, so we get some ditches pretty easily, um, more easily than maybe some other areas of the state. But if there's something that you're always fixing, let them know about it. Um, if there's any weed pressure from a neighbor, let's say um, if the neighbor has really bad thistles, chances are in a couple of years you're going to as well just let them know about it um it, how is the terraces um are they needing some repair if there's irrigation what needs to be out there does anything need, need to be fixed any maintenance out there so just talk to each other um a lot of times it's really easy to jump into the you see a phone call especially right about now um at the end of August and you kind of get a panic on your face if you are a tenant remember don't jump to the bad things always um and just keep an open mind when communicating Jim you can go on to the next slide so some when you're out in the field as a landlord what should you be observing well see how the field is looking overall are there some critical points in the field that are always having the same issues, maybe that indicates that there is a wet spot out in the field. Um, are you seeing more weed pressure than other years? Ask them about it. Um, ask if, you know, maybe stuff didn't get sprayed in time or 
Um, what's going on if you're seeing some more weeds out in the field? How are the maturity of the plants looking? Um, were they planted early? Were they planted late? Um, is the rain sufficient enough to get a good stand? Ask those questions. Don't jump to assumptions. For grazing land, now is a great time to get out into your pastures. See how much grass is out there. Um, we know that as a pasture is continually overgrazed, it takes a lot of time to re rehabilitate those pastures. So go out there, see what the condition of your grass is. Um, see if there's some weed pressure coming down or if there's going to be some noxious weeds or brushes, how the fences is going to look. Um, the noxious weed part and brush control, consider maybe the land owner paying for the chemical and the tenant spraying it and taking care of some fence work, some minor fence work. Um, you know, these everything is up for negotiation between a land owner and a tenant. You guys just have to really talk to each other and have that relationship to um, come to an, a mutual agreement. Jim, you can go to the next slide. So right now, it is August 19th. September 1 is a big that is a big deadline if you have a verbal or a handshake lease. Um so in Nebraska the courts have ruled that leases and a verbal or handshake agreement are 12 month leases that start on March 1. Well, if you want to terminate a tenant, they have to receive a letter in writing prior to September 1. Um, we are recommending everybody changes a verbal or handshake lease agreement to a written contract. And this not only protects the landowner, but also the tenant. Things happen um, and land um, handshake or verbal leases are great until they're not. And so having the terms of a lease on paper really helps ease some miscommunication because it's it's written, you know it, and you're not going to mix it up with maybe another lease that you might have. So if you're going to terminate or change a provision of a lease, it has to be given by September 1, six months prior to March 1. Um, cropland requires that six month notice. Pastures, verbal pasture lease agreements do not. They um, they typically don't require that six-month termination notice because pastures are only leased for the five months out of the year. Um, depending on where you're at in the state can determine when those five months begin and end. But in a pasture lease, that lease ends the last day of that five months. So when they leave their um when they leave the pasture. Jim, you can go on to the next slide. So if relations turn sour, the written lease is not only going to protect both parties, but it's also going to be maybe avoid some legal fees because it's going to hold up better than a he said, she said situation. Um, it protects both of you guys in case of any unforeseen circumstances. So you know, as operators and landowners are aging um, and most of the operators are over 55, most of the landowners are 55 and older, um, events can happen regardless of anybody's age. So if a landlord passes, either the spouse or their heirs need to know what is happening um, with that lease. If an operator, a lot of times what we see is a dad will pass away and now maybe the um, heir or the spouse is taking over the farm operation or the management of the operation and they don't know the terms. Um, by having everything written out, you're protecting your heirs and your interests a lot more, um, especially as more and more generations are being removed from the farm. We're seeing a lot of heirs become landowners that don't have that background. So by having it in a lease, they know that they are not being taken advantage of. This is what was happening prior um, to the passing away of the original landowner. Um, 
it just eases a lot of different problems that may arise. So spell out your contracts. Um, you know, you can keep it simple, but keep it detailed. Um, you don't have to get it too complicated. Jim, you can go on to the next one. So what should be considered if you're going to have a written lease? Well, can review your conservation practices. Um, are you a no-till operation? Is your land typically no-till? If it is, do you want to keep it in no-till? If so, you can put that in a lease. Is there any non-cropland weed control that you need to address? Um, if you have came to one of my meetings, I talk a lot about a miscommunication between a landowner and tenant about a dry lot area that was getting some weeds in it. If you have a homestead or an area that you held some really emotional attachment to and you want to see it kept up, you can put that in the lease, but consider discounting maybe some lease, um, some things if that tenant is covering those typical landowner expenses. If you want those road ditches sprayed, um, mowed, you know, you guys can put that in the lease. When do you want to receive payment for your lease? I really like to see, especially in cash rent situations, half the payment due at signing, half the payment due at the end. Not only does this allow landowners to have the cash that they need to pay land taxes um, both times, but it also helps an operator by not having that the entire cash rent payment all at one time when interest rates are, let's just say 10%. Um, it's an extra, they're saving some interest there. If you are going to have a written lease, what's your termination process look like? Um, is it every year at the end of the, it's terminated when that lease is done? That's an okay way to do it. And then you guys have to readdress it every single year. Are you going to have a holdover clause in your lease, which if you have a holdover clause, how are you going to terminate it later on down the road? So when I say holdover clause, I am referring to, I only want to do this paperwork once. I just want to re-sign it at the bottom every single year just to make sure it's good. That's okay, but you have to have that ver that lease termination notice date in the lease. Otherwise, it reverts back to a verbal lease. Um, are there any other provisions? Are you signing a multi-year lease because maybe the tenant is putting on all the lime and they need to protect themselves since that's typically a landowner expense? You can have a multi-year lease that has a clause in there that every single year you are going to reevaluate the cash rental rate. You don't have to have it all locked into one. And I do encourage people, if they are signing a multi-year lease, have a clause in there that you reevaluate what the rental rate will be every year to mutually agree on something. Um, Jim, you can go on to the next slide. You guys can put whatever you guys want in the lease as long as it's mutually agree upon. So when should a lease be renegotiated? Try and have it happen at the same time every single year just because a lot of times um, things get pushed off, pushed off. So by saying that we're going to reevaluate a lease in, let's say, April every single year, you're going to avoid that confusion and avoid any mistrust among the people um, and among the two parties. It doesn't have to be done by September 1, but you guys just need to know when are you guys going to talk because there shouldn't be any, well, the farmer is planting, what's the rate? Um, have those conversations before the field work happens. We don't really have any specific recommendations here. We're just really encouraging both parties to talk to each other um, regarding a lease early on because inputs are high, interest rates are high. Talk, talk about things. Jim, you unmuted and you got your video on. What can I? Yeah, so we had two questions that are fairly timely to your topic, Anastasia. I'll go ahead and read those out for everyone. And if you could respond to them, they are on the topics that you're 
negotiate you know, on the topic of renegotiating verbal leases. Do verbal lease termination requirements apply the same if the tenant is the one doing the terminating? So yes, the tenant can terminate you six months prior. The requirements are still the same. However, it's a little bit different when a tenant is doing the terminating. Um, typically, you know, if it is December and within that six month time frame, if the tenant doesn't want to farm and let's say it is December, they don't want to take over again in March, chances are you're going to find an, a tenant to take up that lease pretty fast. Um, so yes, it does require, but a lot of times we don't see this issue pushed if a tenant is doing the terminating. All right. And then the second question, if a lease is transitioning from shares, I'm assuming crop shares to cash lease, does the September 1 deadline apply? Do the new terms need to be communicated by September 1 or can they be say, be uh, renegotiated at a later date? Well, that kind of depends on the two parties. So typically, whether it is a cash rent or a crop share, if it is a verbal lease, it has to be renegotiated, any lease provision changes, or um, terminated by that September 1 deadline. Yes. However, if you guys have a good relationship and a lot of times verbal leases are renegotiated after that September 1 deadline, but if it goes to court... It's not going to hold because it's after that September 1 deadline, that six-month deadline. So it depends on the parties. Um, technically, yes, any lease provision changes, any regardless of crop share or cash rent has to be done by September 1. All right. Very good. I think you still have a few more slides here, but uh, we just had those come in. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, I'll go to the next slide here if you want me to. Yep. So I have really emphasized the need of getting a cash or crop share lease on paper. Now you can go to a lawyer and get something drafted. You guys can draft something yourselves. Um, whatever you guys want to do, that's okay. If you want some help and trying not to recreate a, a wheel, we have this agleese101.org. You can get a free PDF lease. And so you'll come up to this web page and you will click document library um, that is highlighted or circled in the top right. It will then take you to this page right here. And this has some really good information on it. If we talk about the left side first, our different lease publications. A lot of times we are asked hey, we are renting an old homestead. Um, it has a machine shed. What should I be paying for the machine shed? And so on this left-hand side, you'll have like a rental agreement for farm buildings, livestock facilities. It's the best information that we have to go off of. Um, I will say that it is dated. It hasn't been updated for quite some time. So you might have to adjust pay um, the rate a little bit but it's better than nothing. Um, so you guys can go look through there. But on the right hand side is the lease forms that I really like. So these are all PDF forms. Um, so you don't have to have a copy of Microsoft to save them, to edit them. You can download them onto your computer, save them. And maybe you guys just change the cash rental rates every single year, or maybe you just change the date every single year, reprint it off, sign it. Um, not only are these a good lease, it gives a lot of things that maybe you don't think about. And when I talk about maybe things you don't think about, I'm really thinking about hunting leases, subleasing. Um, those are some things that can really cause some mistrust among people. Because um, remember, if you are renting, if I'm renting land from Jim, I have control of that land, even if you pay taxes on it. So if Jim comes on to the land I'm renting, he wants to hunt, I could file trespassing charges on him and 
he would get trespassing charges on his own piece of ground. So if you want to retain those rights, if you want to limit any subleasing out to people, you need to have it in writing. And these provide a good source of where to start um, your written lease agreement. If there are things that are not, um, if you don't think they should be in there, you guys can cross them out. Um, it at least gives you some good ideas of how to get that lease started and what to include. Jim, you can go on to the next one. So now we have an Ask Our Expert. So if you guys have any questions, you can drop them in the question chat box. Does not matter. Um, we have some common ones that we get asked really frequently or some ones that were submitted earlier. So we'll start answering those questions and then we will come back to your other questions and answers at the end. All right, very good. I think we're gonna, we have four questions prepared and we'll be doing every other one. And as Anastasia said, if you can drop it into the question and answer pane, we'll try to answer those to the best of our ability. So I think we're moving right along with our time today. All right, the first question, uh, with some of the recent changes we've seen in commodity prices for um, corn, soybeans, things of that nature, how do we set up a flexible lease arrangement? How do we deal with a flex lease when it comes to uh, setting a farmland lease up. And this is, gives us an idea here on uh, with a flex lease and you are covering this as part of our in-person workshops this summer and it takes at least 20 minutes to kind of get a base idea. But uh, the blue line is kind of the base starting point, what we call the base rent. And from the base rent, we either let the cash rent go up or down so to subject to some type of risk. That might be a change in the commodity prices. That might be a change in um, crop yield from what we expect. But we're going to let that uh, cash rent vary around a little. So this first slide right we hear, and I put this uh, slide together a little while ago, and it probably should have been updated a little bit more. But uh, so we have two cases. On the left-hand side, we have a situation where the uh, corn price goes up. And on the right-hand side, we have a price where it goes down. And in this lease arrangement, we have a flexible cash lease. We uh, sign the lease. We think that uh, the cash rent should be, let's say, 220 an acre and the bushels per acre. Uh, we anticipate over the last 10 years we've raised, or last five years we've raised about 150 bushel. That's kind of our baseline. Now, from that, two different things happen. On the left-hand side, we will actually see commodity prices trend up a little higher. On the right-hand side, we see them come down. And unfortunately, I'm afraid we're gonna be on the right-hand side this year because of some of the price dropping. Maybe we'll see a little bit of a bounce back, but uh, sub $4 corn, it's not uncommon to see across the majority of Nebraska, I would say right now. I haven't looked at the commodity prices lately, but uh, this is goes to show you we do a percent change based on our expectations. So, okay, we think the price of corn was gonna be 466, and then we actually plug in what happens, and we figure out the percent change. Left-hand side, it goes up, right-hand side, it comes down, and you work through that, you take that percent change, 9.7% times 220, 9.7% times 220, and we see a breakdown here on how the final cash rent uh, actually trickles out or actually comes out. Okay, Anastasia, you want to take this one? Yep, and I'm going to ask you a question real fast because we are often asked this. What price do I pick? What price do I use? Yeah, so in the prior example, I kind of didn't point this out, but if you notice, we have what's called the planting time price guarantee. This is a 30-day futures price average that's affiliated or used with crop insurance. Uh, it's publicly available, and we know what the planting time price is. We don't know the harvest price until this fall. Whether you use this 30-day futures price average or um, some type of a, you know, let's pick the price every Friday in May, and we're going to compare it against the average price every day in, uh, say, November, we need to have an average. Now, if you want that average price to be your local elevator or wherever you sell grain, uh, or if you want it to be a futures price, that's fine. Uh, whether you go online, uh, some of the uh, 
grain elevators, you can just go online and print out a page and you know put it in a binder or something. So you have proof whether your landlord or tenant doesn't matter. But we want to use a price that is accessible to us, whether you use the futures price, which the planting time price is an average of the futures price, or your local cash price and just do an average over it. Either one is fine, but we're going to be comparing two different periods. We have our baseline and we're going to compare it against what actually happens. Okay, so I don't care if it's a local cash, futures price, we're trying to find a change. What happened from our expert? Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, so a common question that we are also asked is what provisions need to be in a verbal lease termination letter? So my disclaimer is Nebraska Extension does not provide a sample letter. But what you should include at, at the minimum would be the date, the name and address of both the landlord and the tenant, the legal the legal description of the property, um, any term stating the termination lease. So the date they have to be out of there with their property removed, um, with when they can no longer come back on the last day of the uh, termination of the lease. You can consult an attorney. Usually it's a minimal fee to send out a termination letter, but we do really, really suggest that certified mail. That way they cannot claim that they did not receive that letter if you are terminating. You know, we, we know terminations happen sometime verbally, but legally, it's you need to have that documentation that it was received by September 1. Um, you know, removal of personal property by such and such date, anything that is attached to the land technically has to stay. Um, so any, any panels that they have on, maybe they have an okay corral, something like that, um, they need to be have it removed by then. Jim, you can go to the next slide. All right, I'll take this one and then you can take the following one. We have a property, the ground is going to be sold. And the, so if the ground will be sold and the current lease ends on say February 29th, 2025, this notification needs to be given to the tenant on the lease termination. Well, irregardless of the time of the year, whenever a property gets sold, Having an open line of communication is always important. Whether it's open line of communication followed up with a letter or email, that either one's fine. But uh, you should always show professional courtesy to the other party involved. So that individual can make arrangements. If they know they're not going to be renting the ground next year, they probably don't need to be ordering seed corn or uh, soybean seed if, you know, whatever. Again, basic inputs you'll need for the following year, which those negotiations, uh, pricing of inputs are happening right now. Uh, people are starting to get a feel on where things are headed. And uh, also on the topic of termination, once again, what is in the lease? Written versus verbal. Uh, we wanna know what that other person know prior to September 1, 2024, if the property is gonna be sold, say early on in 25, after the first year, that's fine. But if you do not let the other party know, that tenant, can actually farm the property. Now the former landowner may not be getting the cash rent from that sale, but they can let the other party, um, the, the payment for the cash rent can actually continue on for the following growing year, even if you have a new owner, the cash rent might go to someone else. Well, whatever terms are in that lease are gonna go forward. And with a written lease, there's a thing called um, does, when does the lease end? Does it end at the end of the lease or do you have this thing called the rollover clause that states basically if no one says anything to the other one or does anything different than what's in the written lease, wants anything different than what's in the written lease, it's just going to continue on for another year. So once again, just let the other folks know. All right. You know, Stasia, you want to take this one? I can. So what is the best way to structure a crop share lease agreement and um, what provisions should be in the agreement? Well, Ag Lease 101 has a great insight on the structure and related provisions on what should be considered in a crop share lease. Um, it does, if you download that document, it does break it at, 
down to herbicides, insecticides, um, and it you can go in there and mark up what what inputs you are sharing and what inputs you are not. Um, Jim, you want to go to the next slide. So it needs to be, this kind of goes into that next one. Do you want me to keep on going? Because they all kind of tie together. No. Okay. So what's the best way to structure a crop share? Well, it needs to be even. You What you put in should be relative to what you get out. So if you're putting in 40% of the inputs, you need to be getting out 40% of the grain as well. Um, how it is divided up is going to be drastically different, whether you are dry land irrigated, um, if you're in the panhandle versus if you were on the eastern side. So what your sharers will drastically vary, even from Jim um, on the northern side of the state to myself on the southern side of the state. So these are my general rules of thumb. Anything that is a yield increasing input is shared. So the landowner will be covering all of the land taxes, irrigation, operation, maintenance. Now, that's not to say that in a typical lease that we see, um, the farmer will pay up to maybe $1,000, $500, $1,000, whatever you guys agree upon of repairs. But anything after that is going to be a landowner expense. The cost of irrigation, um, all of the insurance, all, all of that. The tenant covers the labor, minor repairs, field operations, and cost of transporting the grain to the local elevator to market. So what's shared is the crop insurance. Each party will get their own. Any fertilizer, insecticide, and fungicide in the growing season. Um, when I specify in the growing season is a lot of times in the no-till we have pre and post um, ap herbicide applications. Those are going to be just depending on what you guys agree upon. Um, a lot of times pre is just covered by the tenant, but I have also seen them share that as well. Um, the, if you have any energy for irrigation, that should be shared. And the cost, the seed is on here. And this is a tricky one here because typically seed has not been covered um, by both parties, but as seed is getting more and more expensive and as more and more traits are stacked onto the seed, it is something that you guys should be considering sharing. I do see a lot of times maybe the landowner just pays a small percentage of the fee, so maybe not the 40%, but we call it the technology on the seed. Um, and this is all negotiable but it should be considered to be shared. And then each party is going to market their share of the crops. We really, if you go back to the next slide, the last slide that you we skipped. So the best way to structure a crop share lease is to really have that good communication and talk about what your expenses are versus what your revenue from crop sales are going to be. Because you need to look at both of those and make sure they are balanced. If you're entering into a crop share lease agreement, that communication needs to be there and that openness to share those um, inputs and the revenue. Because um, not only are you going... You also need to think about, you know, if there's any government disaster payments, we might be seeing some farm commodity payments um, from the farm bill this year. If you're in a crop share, those are going to be shared. And then if you get your own crop insurance, you know, if you have a bad year, you're going to trigger payments on both parties, depending on what levels. But I like this scale because it should be evened out. Um, it needs to be fair. And so if you don't think it's fair, start asking some questions and then maybe you'll find out that it is actually um, fair. What I have seen in multiple years is uh, when I have really sat down and looked with some people, did a deep dive into their budgets is maybe one crop they get on a 60-40 lease, maybe one crop they get 45% and then maybe the next year on a, the other crop they'll get 35%, but just as long as everything is balancing out in the end. Jim, do you have anything to add to that? No, those are all good points. Um, see here, we had a 
Uh, I just wanted to point a few things out. Um, if you're interested in making any donations towards our outreach that we're doing here, just go to the website, the NU Foundation can take them, and uh, that just helps support conducting the survey and our outreach we do. And also, we have in-person meetings coming up. Our in-person meetings are uh, scheduled, the ones that are remaining here for August and September. Uh, some of them have lunch included. Some are just light refreshments. Uh, please uh, be sure to uh, call ahead just to make sure we got enough handouts to go around and things like that. Yep. Um, I wanted to go back here for a minute and um, talk about a few questions. Uh, maybe I'll take the first one, Anastasia, and then you can maybe take uh, the next. I'll tell you what, why don't you take the first one? Okay. So the first question is, what should a landlord consider if negotiating a multi-year lease? Okay, so if you are considering a multi-year lease, you really need to think about having a clause in there that states every single year you guys are going to readjust maybe especially if it's a cash rent situation you guys need to readjust the rental amount um just because let's say as a landowner you don't want to get stuck with a low rent if things are looking good as a tenant you don't want to get stuck when at a really high rental rate if things are not being good um, in the farm outlook so have that clause in there that you're going to reevaluate the cash rental rate every single year um and then just make sure that you have that termination notice in there that if you want to terminate early this is when they're going to be let, notified by yeah, Anastasia and I, I think we both agree that we like multi-year relationships. I'm not crazy, and I don't believe she is either. There's just so much uncertainty right now. We have a lot of different things coming up in November. Mm -hmm. you know, where, you know, where's the price of corn and soybeans going to be? Well, be in let's say two, three months, yet alone two, three years from now. Obviously, we've seen a lot of different things occurring. So that's why if you do a multi-year lease, as she said. Uh, be sure to consider renegotiating that cash rent each year to account for those different things. And whether that's up or down or anywhere in between, yeah. uh, we like to do that renegotiation provision. Just not, it's so many dollars an acre for the next two, three, four, five, six, whatever years. Nobody knows what's going to happen in five years. Just think about what's happened in the last five years. With it. Yeah. Okay. All right, the next, next question. question. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Jim, do you have any statistics on cash rent based on soil types? So we do not. We just have the, the two different places. We didn't talk about the second one today. Iowa State might have some cash rent based on their soil indexes and that. We only have the regional. When I say we, the University of Nebraska only publishes regional level cash rents. The USDA does publish county level cash rents, which I would bet they're probably going to be there's usually a map that comes out here at some point in September, early October. And um, it makes a pretty good indication. You can kind of see, at least from the USDA, how do cash runs vary around in each of the regions? The take on I've seen is it tends to be some of the counties in the eastern part of the region instead of the western part. Cash runs sometimes are a little bit higher. So that's the best resource we have. All right, next question for you, Anastasia. If, is the tenant... Um, when the tenant subleases on a cropland lease arrangement, so an annual lease arrangement, when they sublease, let's say, corn stocks to someone else, is that considered a form of subleasing? And is that something a landlord can restrict or not restrict as part of the lease arrangement? So if the tenant is renting out the piece of ground to any other person, whether it is corn stocks or hunting rights, whatever it may be, that is considered subleasing. So yes, you can restrict out subleasing that they can't sublease out to anybody, um, regardless of the of what the cause that they are renting it out for. Now, if the tenant is putting his own cattle out onto those corn stocks, that is not subleasing um i generally tell people you know depending on the different areas if a tenant wants to put their cattle out on your, the corn stocks 
Um, maybe you consider just letting them do it if they're not subleasing simply for the fact of they're the ones putting out the electric fence um, in my area you might be hauling water or there's at least going and watering every single day whether it's turning on a well or not um, maybe you just consider that because it's might it leads to less trash um, it'll lead to some extra fertilization in there now, if they're subleasing out to another person, maybe you consider asking for a portion of that subleasing, depending on the area. Um, I grew up in an irrigated farm where they did anything they could just to get rid of that extra corn residue because there was so much left out in the field. Where I am now, that's not really a case. Um, so it kind of depends on where you're at, whether or not you should ask for that extra money. Okay, very good. All right, final question. What type of input split should be appropriate for, let's say, a 50 50 crop share lease, meaning the landlord gets half and then the tenant gets the other half of the income, but also the expenses? Uh, yeah. Anastasia, you want to, I brought up the slide here. You want to expand on that a little bit? Yep. So I, my cost is generally the same, um, whether it's a 60, 40, any yield increasing input should be shared. Um, for a 50, 50, I really do recommend that the seed should be shared, but otherwise it's the same as this slide here, the fertilized insecticide, fungicide, um, depending, you know, maybe they share for application for those. I, I know that it, their application varies dramatically. Um, I know that sometimes um, when the co-op bills it, it is shared. Sometimes if the tenant owns a sprayer and they're the one doing the work, they don't cost share it. Maybe they should. Um, you know, I, that's when you're really going to have to have that open communication with each other. Okay, very good. And uh, the question, I'll just, I just seen it pop in the chat here. Who pays for fence repairs? And I'm assuming this is fence repairs related to grazing land. Uh, when it comes to grazing land, I think the initial assumption when you rent a property to someone, the land is kept up, meaning the fences are in good shape. Just like if you rent an irrigated parcel to someone, they want to rent a, uh, an irrigated parcel that the pivot's still in good shape. Mm -hmm. uh, major upgrades to the fence, you have a quarter mile fence that needs, needs to get replaced because the posts are all rotted. Well, in my view, at least the materials are a landlord expense because tenants probably not going to go out and pull out all those posts when they vacate the property. Minor upkeep from year to year, what is minor? Now, is that just pulling up some wires, maybe pounding in a new post or two? That could be maybe something the tenant might do. But if there is major upgrades and the tenant is the one doing the upgrades, digging 40 post holes, pounding in 60 posts, whatever, under that case, I would be looking at a situation where we might discount the cash rent to the tenant to account for their time, talent, equipment, gas, diesel, whatever they're using, gas-powered post driver, diesel-powered tractor that they use. Um, I think those are expenses that uh, if the tenant does bear them. Because remember, permanent fencing, unlike uh, one electric wire that's ran around an irrigated quarter to graze the corn stalks, the uh, permanent fencing, they're more than likely not going to be removing from the property. So We do oh, have yeah. a hand raised as well. Yeah, if that person could type that either into the chat or the question, I got a few slides here just to kind of finish up on. Just a reminder, uh, we have our in-person meetings here in August and then one in September, and then we'll be headed out to Husker Harvest Days. We're going to be doing a short presentation, I think, at two o'clock in the women and ag area during Husker harvest days. And that will be and located right next to the UNL barn, I believe. There you go. And the uh, upcoming topics that we have for November, it's hard to think the year just seems to be slipping by again. Uh, we have our outline of different topics here. We'll be taking a look at the USDA, uh, some of the different cash rents with that. Uh, the county level and also any farm program payments from income and the Anastasia will be taking a look at leases and communication once again things to be thinking about for 2025 and then once again if you got questions the sooner you submit them are likely not uh, 
it gives us a little more time to actually prepare a slide instead of just typing it into the chat, which is fine. But uh, if you email, send that in a week before, so it'll take 20 minutes to try to put together a good response for you. Okay. So with that, if you got questions, be sure to reach out to either one of us and we would be more than happy to visit with you. Anastasia, do you have anything else to add? I do not. All right. Well, we appreciate everyone for joining us today. And uh, with that, it's one minute to one. So I think we met our time. Things worked out just great again. So thanks, everyone.